precious book. It's actually a collection of sermons. You know, we always, in the New Testament, we always associate the Gospels as a his, sort of the narrative or the historical books and the epistles of Paul and others uh, to be interpretive. In this case, the, the last book of the Torah, the fifth book of, of, of the Torah, is really a series of about four sermons by Moses right on the threshold of his death. And he sort of recaps history and reemphasizes things. And as he does, we learn some new things. Some of the things that he's amplifying from the book of Exodus, he's really giving us new insights into. We'll stumble on a few of those in, the next, in this particular evening. But the book of Deuteronomy, Moses' own commentary, as, the, uh, as he finishes, what, 120 years? 40 years uh, in Egypt, finding out who he was, and then 40 years in the backside of the desert, getting ready for the wilderness wanderings, whether he knew it or not. And then... Uh, uh, when they, did, when, he, when they were delivered and failed in faith at Kedesh Barnea and thus inherited another 40 years of wandering while that generation passed away and their children uh, developed, uh, all this time Moses is, uh, is leading them, only to discover, of course, at the end of his days or along the way here, that he's in the penalty box that because of, of his own uh, failure to properly represent God in one particular incident, uh, he will not enter the promised land. He'll be able to see it from the mountain before he dies, but the baton will be passed to Joshua, as you all know. In fact, the last few uh, uh, parts of the book of Deuteronomy are obviously added by editors uh, re- re- which uh, ca- record Moses' death. But here we have Moses, probably uh, clearly, clearly, up until Christ, the, the most dominant person in the Bible, uh, expressing uh, his concerns and, and what God had laid on his heart to, for them to deal with. So we're in the book of Deuteronomy. We're in the seventh session, and uh, we're going to be dealing with two chapters, chapters 15 and 16, in this session. We're going to encounter about three major subjects. First 11 verses that will have to do with the cancellation of debts. And uh, then the next few verses, uh, freeing of servants, and some comments about the firstborn of animals. That will co- uh, occupy uh, chapter 15. So Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, and let's do something that uh, we should never fail to do when we open the Word of God. Let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we praise you for who you are. We thank you, Father, for your Word and the extremes that you've gone to that we might have life. We do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit you'd open our lives to your Word and open your word to our understanding that in all these things we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we commit this evening and ourselves. Amen. So Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. At the end of every seven years, thou shalt make a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lendeth uh, unto his neighbor shall release it. And he shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother, because it is called the Lord's release. And uh, so this is the cancellation of debts. Now it's interesting, most of us may recall from Exodus 23 and Leviticus 25, the concept of the sabbatical year. But it's interesting, if you go back and look at those passages carefully, you'll discover what it focuses on is the ownership of property. When you sold a piece of land, you didn't really, you didn't sell it in what we, uh, as we do, which is called fee simple, where it go, you, the right to that land goes to your heirs and assigns. Uh, it actually is, it, it is a, a, a transaction that you and I would characterize in our culture as a lease. Because at the end of seven years, it would return back to the family to whom it was allocated by the Lord. The land did not belong to Israel. The land belonged to the Lord, and they had occupancy of it as tenants under conditions of obedience. But it was uh, ascribed to each of the tribes. So, and even if you went ahead and sold it, as they would say, or lease it, as we would say, uh, there was always provisions that uh, that, uh, the next of kin could redeem the the property. And you need to really understand those laws in Exodus 23 and Leviticus 25, or you will not understand the book of Revelation. Because what's really going on there from chapter 5 on is the closing of an escrow, taking possession of what Christ purchased at the cross. But to really understand the dynamics, you need to understand the whole concept of title passage as it operated in the Bible, not as we do it uh, in our culture. So uh, for what it's worth. But there's something I want to highlight here. 
it may come as a surprise that this idea of cancellation of debts isn't mentioned in the passages that are character- typically characterized this seven-year thing, which is uh, the so-called sabbatical year, Exodus 23 and 25. And this is something Moses is either reinterpreting or adding or commenting on something that they're pres- pre- uh, 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 supposed to know. And uh, of a foreigner, thou mayest exact it again. But that which is thine with thy brother and thine hand shall release. Save when there shall be no poor among you. For the Lord, uh, when, uh, the Lord shall greatly bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it. Only if thou carefully hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to, to do all these commandments which I command thee this day. Again, all the way through, Moses emphasizing their, their blessings are conditional upon obedience. And uh, this whole idea of, of uh, forgiving debts was, uh, uh, was operative here. I find this personally rather fascinating because as many of you may know uh, that uh, I went through after even, even after an executive career where I made my living taking companies out of chapter 11 I ended up um, going down myself in flames and uh, uh, went through bankruptcy and uh, one of the aspects of bankruptcy is that one of the debts that are not forgiven in bankruptcy is the federal taxes and the Internal Revenue Service thought I owed them $2.5 million, uh, $2. million dollars Interestingly enough, uh, it was negotiated away for a nominal amount after seven years. Now, there's nothing magic about seven years as far as the IRS is concerned, but I found it very fascinating that at the end of seven years, we ended up in in an arrangement that uh, took care of uh, that apparent liability, um, and it took seven years to do that. So I found that very biblical, very, very, very uh, provocative. Um, I'll talk a little bit more uh, about the bankruptcy thing as we go forward here. But um, uh, uh, ver- ver- down to verse 6. For, for the Lord thy God blesses thee as he promised thee, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow, and thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. This whole idea of being forgiving, on the de- forgiving the debts after uh, seven years is a, um, was God's way of causing them to... Um, Recognize that all their provision is from him in the first place. And he expected them to be generous as a result. Just as he was gracious to them, he wanted them to be gracious to others. And, and, and he's also, some commentators make the point that he's preparing them for a time when Israel will be the dominant nation on the planet Earth in the millennium. The king of the earth is a Jew. He's a Jewish king. He's also a national king, the king of Israel. And he's the one that is going to take his throne. God made a promise to Mary that her child would sit on David's throne. And made it very explicit there in Luke chapter 1 verse 32. And it's, a, it's astonishing to me to recognize the, the reality that most church, I'd say nine churches out of ten, deny that. Or find a way to duck that or uh, to avoid uh, hitting it head on. Because the throne of David did not exist in those days. Rome was ruling the world at that time. And the king of uh, uh, operative in Jerusalem was Herod, who was not a Jew. He was an Edomite, appointed by Rome. That was not the throne of David. And uh, the dynasty of David was committed to be a perpetual dynasty. That's uh, <laughs> probably five sixths of the new of the Old Testament is uh, about. But in any case, uh, there is a destiny for the nation Israel that's that'll be quite startling, uh, even to many many Christians, because uh, they haven't really done their homework. But uh, but what God is doing here through Moses, or Moses is uh, emphasizing, is that they're getting trained. That was the intent here. And uh, they, thou shalt lend unto many nations, but not borrow. That obviously is not true today, obviously, but that will be true in the millennium. Thou shalt reign over many nations, and, uh, but, but they shall not reign over thee. That hasn't ha- it happened lately, have you noticed? You know, it's fascinating to me to watch the primary preoccupation on the planet Earth today is the title to that piece of ground. Israel's right to the land. And that's what the, all this tension's about. That's, what, that, that, that's the root of all of this is a challenge to Genesis 15, Genesis 17, God's grant to Israel. But uh, let's keep moving on here. Verse 7, if there be among you a poor man 
of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. But thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shall surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. That's God's instruction. They were to be a, a, a not just a nation, but a family. And they are to, they were, they, they, to take care of each other. It's very interesting to understand the provisions for welfare all through the, the legal system for ancient Israel. And uh, we'll, we'll notice a couple of interesting characteristics about that particular culture had they followed God's instruction. He goes on here in verse 9, Beware that, thou, that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him naught. And he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. In other words, okay, uh, uh, chafing, if you will, under this requirement that in the seventh year his deaths are absolved. Um, uh, uh, that should not give resentment. It's rather an opportunity because it's, it, the relationship isn't just with him. It's with the Lord. And, and to fail to, to be generous is a sin. It be sin unto thee. Now, it's interesting. Solomon probably had this in mind. In Proverbs eleven twenty four, it says, One man gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly and comes to poverty. And uh, that's the principle that Solomon underscores here. It's, it, it, it echoes the same thing that Moses is uh, recounting for us in Deuteronomy 15. Let's move on. I want to use, use this opportunity to talk a little bit about the bankruptcy laws, because it's interesting as I go among Christians... There's some very there's a lot of confusion about the whole idea of bank. We don't ha- we don't operate our culture under the Torah. At the same time, we have alternative provisions that are probably somewhat in, in parallel. The bankruptcy laws are intended to give somebody who's fallen into d- difficulties an opportunity to make a new start, a new beginning. That's a constructive purpose, and uh, the, uh, the many people don't understand what a chapter eleven is. Chapter eleven is not bankruptcy. A chapter 11, we use the phrase a lot, is actually a procedure to reorganize in lieu of bankruptcy. It's basically a contract between the debtor, the person in trouble, typically a corporation, and the court. The court agrees to protect that person against their creditors for a period of time, if he meets certain conditions, to give him a chance to reorganize and provide some kind of uh, restructuring. And uh, uh, very often, the... uh, the creditors may get a nickel or a dime on the dollar, but at least there's an opportunity, number one, for them to get something, and number two, to try to reorganize the entity to have a, a continued existence. And uh, once going through, uh, there are certain conditions the debtor has to make to the court to, to enjoy that particular protection. Those are quite straightforward. One of the things you do, he can't, he can't make any payments outside the provision of the court. That would be a form of fraud, in effect. And at the same time, uh, anyway, I, I won't get into all those mechanics, except to point out that it's probably one of the most powerful corporate development tools in America, if understood and, and, and if used properly. I made a 30-year career of dealing with public com- technology companies, typically, that are in, chapters, in Chapter 11 situations. And uh, there's only two times that a co- corporation is absolutely clean, when it's first formed and when it's discharged from a, from a federal bankruptcy uh, proceeding. Unless it fails, or, and finally it drops into a seven or a, some equivalent uh, provision. But um, uh, what that should include, by the way, is a dismissal of all pre-filing debts. Uh, there are, uh, the, with the exception, of course, of the federal government, which is an express provision, and uh, games that are played by certain states, no, most notorious is the state of California. But I won't get into that here. Uh, we'll keep this on a positive note. Let's move on. Oh, I, I, I guess I want to also mention... Uh, it's interesting to me to um, uh, notice that the uh, having gone through a bankruptcy, that there is there are more accommodations made by professional secular people than Christians. And there are several Christians in the background of the of the bankruptcy that somehow don't acknowledge the reality of our clause. They sort of feel that the debts should, should, should endure after the discharge of, a, of that proceeding, which is, a, it, which is a, uh, you know, in effect, a denial of, of the legal system which we uh, subscribe to. So uh, uh, that's fortunately not, not characteristic uh, 
I had a number of shareholders in a public company that got injured by its failure. But, uh, and some of the most prominent Christians were the most gracious. So I don't want to imply that anything other than that. But on the other hand, there are, you know, I do find, uh, having trafficked in that world, that many Christians are very unsophisticated in their understanding of the bankruptcy laws. And the irony of it is they are, in effect, a reflection of the same principles that are in the Torah. But well, let's move on. For Deuteronomy 15, verse 10. Thou shalt surely give him, this is, the, this is somebody that you're, you, that you're forgiving the debts and so forth, it says, Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works, and in all that thou puttest thy hand unto. In other words, the graciousness that you're extending a debtor is something that the Lord will honor. And you, in effect, are getting double credit. Should be gaining the goodwill of the person that you're assisting, but you're also uh, uh, putting yourself under the, the blessing that God has committed Himself into. The next verse is sort of discouraging in a, in a way. It says, For the poor shall never cease out of the land. You know, I have very bad news for Lyndon Johnson and his war on poverty. Jesus Himself said, The poor you'll always have with you until, until uh, the millennium. So. But the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, and to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land. Pretty straightforward. We could, we could go on and, and, and uh, amplify all of this, but I think it's so straightforward, especially someone with any New Testament perspective, to recognize the broad applicability of this, but especially to your brother, especially a brother of the Lord. And uh, in this case, the context here is a, 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 you know, a fellow Israelite that Moses is talking to. The application for all of us is to recognize an obligation we have to a fellow Christian. And how tragic, how tragic it is that we do a terrible job at that. I think all of us have been around enough in this, uh, to recognize that this is tragically not characteristic of the Christian community as it ought to be. And if thy brother, an Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee. Now, this is a, a similar topic, but really a different one, and that's one of indentured servitude. One of the common ways to work off a debt was to uh, get in, put oneself into bondage to the creditor. But within Israel, the limit to that would be seven years. After seven years, uh, the, the law required you to, to have your freedom. And so uh, it's dealing here now with the, with the owner, if you will, or the, the, the creditor, when thou sendest him out free from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty. Oh, see, it's not a question of just, okay, you've paid me off, goodbye. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy winepress, of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt give unto him. The floor, of course, is the thrashing floor. It's an it's a, it's a agricultural uh, culture. You, I think that should be pretty straightforward. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock, out of thy floor, out of thy winepress. Of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt give unto him. In other words, it isn't yours in the first place. God's blessing you, and part of his uh, expectation is that you should be liberal with him. Now, for most of us from a New Testament background, um, that's pretty straightforward. Jesus amplified that pretty, pretty clearly in, the, in a number of his expressions and a number of his specific examples. So let's just keep moving. Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. And the Lord thy God redeemed thee, therefore I command thee this thing today. Moses got a problem, by the way. He's dealing with the generation that grew up. It was the parents that really understood this. It was the parents 40 years ago that were uh, uh, redeemed out of Egypt. So they had the vivid uh, experience of the crossing of the Red Sea and the provision throughout the wilderness and so forth. And they had bitter memories of what it was like to be a slave in Egypt. We, in effect, here have a generation gap because what people, with the exception of two people, Joshua and Caleb, the entire audience that uh, Moses is expressing the sermon to are the children uh, of those people. And uh, it's naive of us to expect that they really understood because to them it's hearsay. So that was, that's part of the challenge. And it's interesting all the way through, if you may recall the lessons from the last few sessions, that part of the emphasis throughout the Torah, but especially here, is that it's the requirement, the obligation of the parents, not the Levites and the priests. 
The Levites and the priests had their obligations to teach and instruct, but to teach the children was a, the spe- a specific obligation of the parents. That was the intention of Israel, and that's the, that, uh, that is, uh, uh, there's a tremendous difference learning these things from the parents than learning from a professional instructor. And, uh, but in any case, uh, uh, Moses continues, Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee, therefore I command thee this thing to this day. And it shall be that if he say unto thee, I will not go away from thee, because he loveth thee and thine house, because he is well with thee, then thou shalt take an awl, and thrust it through his ear to the door, and he shall be thy servant forever. And also unto thy uh, maidservant shalt thou do likewise. Now it's interesting, this of course is the whole area of the bond slave. And uh, in the New Testament, it's interesting how John and Paul in their letters, refer to themselves as a servant of Jesus Christ. But if you look at the Greek term they use is doulos, which is not just a slave. It was a term for a very specific category of slave, a, a, and a practice in the, in the Greek culture that emulated the same thing from the Hebrew culture, which was this. Let's assume you got into debt, whatever, and you became indentured to a master, a, sl- a creditor, for your seven years. By the time those seven years have gone by... There were occasions when you were so identified with your loyalty and commitment to that house, to the family, that you chose, you had the option. The law said you were free after seven years and you could go, but you might choose to stay, not go. And if you did, you did it for the rest of your life. You came to a crossroads. You either left as you were entitled to after the end of the seven years, or you could elect to be a doulos or a, a bond slave. And to commemorate that decision, should you make it that way, They would take you and pierce your ear to the doorpost of the house. The idea is you're getting pinned to the house. Not the physical house, it's the family, but it's symbolized by the the threshold. And then in that uh, piercing, you would wear a ring. And uh, the the, the slaves that were wearing the bond slave's ring were considered, uh, they were up a notch, obviously. They weren't there earning off some creditor's, you know, some creditor's obligation. They were there by choice for the rest of their life. So the ring in their ear was a badge of honor. And uh, so that was what they called a bond slave. In the New Testament term, it was a doulos. And, of course, one of the fascinating things, um, I have to insert this anecdote. I'm sure many of you have heard me mention this before. Uh, My wife and I were in a situation where we'd started the ministry. We were still in California up at Big Bear, but we were at the epicenter of an earthquake. And it was just one of a number of circumstances caused us. And it was a, a town of 18,000 people, had 4,500 homes destroyed or damaged. Nobody hurt. Very strange, very disastrous earthquake in many respects, but no, no injuries, interestingly enough. But, uh, and there were a lot of aftershocks and other ap- a- aspects to the situation. But we were convinced for a number of reasons that the Lord was telling us to move. And uh, we were, on my, kids, uh, my wife's side, our kids were fourth generation Newport Beachers. So we're, we had deep roots in California. Uh, and, but uh, to leave California was, uh, we, we, we would not have been open to it except the Lord made it in our minds very clear that he had other things for us. Our dilemma was, where do we go? Where do we move? It happened that we had previously made commitments to do a speaking tour with a recreational vehicle that was arranged for us by the sponsors. And uh, we had about a two-week, the, the part of the incentive in making this tour was that we had a lot of free time involved in going, making this loop from California up through uh, Utah and, and uh, then down the coast. And uh, uh, we were going to go up to Pocatello and then across and down was the idea. And so uh, this was literally uh, 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 about three days after the earthquake hit was when this was all scheduled. And we decided rather than clean up, we just left it. And we honored that commitment as a, our way to... Uh, seek the Lord's direction as to where he would have us go. There were a number, we had a number of people who heard we were going to be moving. He made us some interesting offers. Uh, but for one reason or another, we didn't feel that was what the Lord wanted. We, uh, we were traveling, doing the speaking tour, and had a, had a tremendous response. That was all very encouraging. But I can remember so vividly. And we, we were in Pocatello, and, a fr- and uh, our friend there, uh, uh, Lou Phelps, in uh, Pocatello says, you can't be in Idaho without seeing Coeur d'Alene. So he talks into extending our trip, coming up through Coeur d'Alene, which we obviously did and found it very pleasant. But uh, went back down the coast. And when we, but I, I can remember so vividly, we got home. Terrific trip and all that. But I, I dropped Nan off up at the you know, up in Big Bear, and I was taking the RV back to where it had been rented down in Riverside. 
And as I went down the mountain, having emptied all our stuff to, take, to, to return it, I remember being sort of frustrated, really frustrated, because uh, we'd been praying intensely through the whole two-week period for the Lord to show us what we wanted us to do. We had a couple of uh, offers made to us that were very attractive, and yet we, uh, we somehow knew that wasn't really uh, what the Lord would have us do. But I was very sort of frustrated with him uh, as I was driving down because the one thing I needed, I didn't care where he moved us to. I just needed clarity because so many other families, so many other people are involved. And uh, I remember driving down there. It was, it was the only time, I won't say I heard a voice, but it was awfully close to that. Uh, uh, as I was driving down the hill, a strange phrase went through, entered my mind. Remember your business cards. Now, that wouldn't mean anything to you, but what I, I, I was reminded of something that I had not thought about for over 20 years. When I first started doing home Bible studies and, uh, more actively, I was chairman of the board of a major publicly traded company. I was, uh, at the time, chairman of the board of Western Digital Corporation. Well, often I, when I was doing these talks and stuff, somebody would want a business card, and I didn't feel it was appropriate for me to give them my chairman of the board of Western Digital, you know, my business card. It just didn't seem appropriate. So I had printed up some cards. That, uh, I was teaching Revelation and all that, so I said, uh, and because of the Dulos thing, I said, uh, 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 Charles Nussler, or Chuck Nussler, um, bond, sl- bond, bond servant of Jesus Christ as the title. And then I had my home address and a phone number, whatever. I thought if I, if my intention was that when people would ask me for a business card in a Christian context, I wouldn't give them my business business card. I'd give them my little Christian business card. And so I had these printed up. But I carried a few of them, but I discovered I never used them because I got to a point where I felt that's awfully pretentious. Well, who, who am I to call myself a bond slave of Jesus Christ? So uh, I, I found out I didn't have the demand I thought, and I just did, I didn't use them. I, had a, I may have used them once or twice, but I mean, they fell into disuse, and, and I'd forgotten that whole thing. And uh, driving down from Big Bear to return the veal, it was like a, almost, almost like a voice saying, remember your business cards. And I remember thinking, what has that got to do with anything? <laughs> I remember those business cards. And as I did, I recalled that while we were up in Coeur d'Alene at one of the restaurants, probably the resort, I can't remember where, we were having breakfast, on the menu, it explained that the name Coeur d'Alene was a French term given by the French-Canadian trappers to the local Indians as a backhanded compliment because they were sharp traders. Coeur d'Alene in, in French means heart of the all, uh, like an ice pick, you know, like a shoemaker's all. Coeur d'Alene's are, uh, they have hearts, hearts like an ice pick. Well, it was intended as a, as a, a backhanded compliment of being sharp traders, in fact, though, of course, uh, uh, to someone that's biblically oriented, that whole thought, wow, heart of the bond slave. And it just all linked up. So I remember as soon as I got down to the dealer and took care of the car and got my driver's, you know, my car back and so forth, I called Nan right away and says, we're going to make airline reservations and go back and take another look at Coeur d'Alene. Because I think that may be the, what the Lord has in mind. And that, that led to a whole bunch of other circumstances I'll, I'll spare you. But to us, the word Coeur d'Alene... Uh, it was heart of the bond slave. And uh, because the word all appears only twice in the scripture, in both cases it's an allusion to this procedure of becoming a, for the rest of your life, a servant uh, to the house that you're committed to. And of course, uh, in the same spirit, not, I don't mean to sound pretentious, but in the same spirit of Paul and John, we feel, Nan and I both, that uh, we're totally sold out to the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. So the word, the, the, the name Coeur d'Alene has, has meaning to us. I had to throw that in here because this is um, it seemed appropriate anyway. Um, Deuteronomy 15, verse 18. It shall not seem hard unto thee when thou sendest him away from thee, from, uh, uh, free from thee, for he hath been worth a double hired servant to thee in serving thee six years, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all that thou doest. In other words, what Moses is saying, when he's finished, this guy that's finished with his indenture, assuming he's not signing on to be a, you know, a, a, for the rest of his life bond slave, uh, when you send him away, be generous because he's been worth you twice what a hired servant would be. He's been with you six years, for crying out loud. So, uh, and the Lord, on top of that, the Lord will bless thee. So there's really two thoughts here. One is that you really should anyway. It's, it makes economic sense. But also the Lord himself will uh, participate in blessing you in all that you do, which is a pretty good deal. And uh, so verse 19. Now he shifts subjects, and he's talking. He's been talking about debts, and he's talking about 
uh, servants. So he's been talking about your possessions in two different ways, in terms of, 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 of uh, uh, debtors, in terms of, of, of uh, uh, servants. Now he's going to shift and talk about your animals. And it may sound like it's a different subject, but see, all these things have to do with your possessions, whether they're receivables or, or servanthood or, or uh, animals. So he said, All the firstling males that come out of thy herd and out of thy flock shalt thou sanctify unto the Lord thy God, and thou shalt do no work with the firstlings of thy bullock, nor shear the firstling of thy sheep. Now it's interesting. Uh, uh, the firstborn of, of your herd were useless to you. You weren't allowed to plow with the ox. You're not allowed to uh, shear the sheep. And I have no idea what that meant, because I thought that you had to for their own health. I didn't, in any case... But thou shalt do no work with the firstling of thy bullock, nor shear the firstling of thy sheep. The idea was that these belong to the Lord. The first, the first fruits belong to the Lord, and they're his, not yours. That's the concept that sort of undergirds this. It's more pedagogical probably than practical. But thou shalt eat it before the Lord thy God year by year in the place which the Lord shall choose, thou and thy household. So they're going to be offered. And the offering, of course, was something that the family participated in as a feast. And if there be any blemish therein, as if it be blame, uh, lame or blind or have any ill blemish, thou shalt not sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. See, the intent was the firstborn was to be sacrificed. And by the way, that's also true of your children. But, the, but they also had provision that you redeemed your child by paying, a, paying the temple a, a redemption coin. So you, you redeemed it. But technically, the firstborn was also committed to the Lord. And, uh, but in the case of the, the, the animals here, thou shalt eat it within thy gates... The unclean, the clean person, shall eat it alike as the roebuck and as of the heart. Only thou shalt not eat the blood thereof, thou shalt pour it upon the ground as water. That's always added, as you may recall. That even becomes an issue in Acts 15 in the Council of Jerusalem that James presides over. It's interesting, up till now, they always sacrifice it in front of the tabernacle. What they're trying to do when they were wandering as a, as a tribe, an you know, itinerant tribe, is provide control over the killing, that the killing was always done, never done in pagan terms, always done in terms of an offering to the Lord. At this point, they're growing enough, they're entering the land, they're, gonna, they're, they're starting to decentralize some of this. That's where you shall eat it within thy gates. You can eat it at home, if you will. You may go to the priest and bless it and all that, but you can conduct this at home. The unclean and the clean person shall eat it alike, as the roebuck and as the heart. And the only thou shalt not eat the blood thereof, I shall pour it upon the ground as water, because the life is in the blood, and the blood is, is, is uh, prohibited uh, to, to partake of. And so that ends chapter 15. Let's keep moving here with Deuteronomy uh, 16. Two major topics here. One is the pilgrim festivals, and I'll explain what those were. There were seven feasts of Moses, but three of them were obligatory. A very unusual three. We'll come to that when we finish, but we, we'll take this occasion to take a look at the seven feasts of Moses, uh, seven feasts of Israel. There are other feasts that are not Mosaic feasts, namely Purim from the book of Esther. It's a legitimate, appropriate Jewish observance. Also Hanukkah. Uh, both of these are authenticated in the Bible. Hanukkah is also in John chapter 10, even in the New Testament. But there are seven feasts in the Torah specifically described. Three of them were obligatory, and that's what Moses is going to touch on. And they'll talk a little bit about priests and judges at the end. Observe the month of Abib. Now, Abib is one of two terms for that month. It's also called Nisan. Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God, for in the month of Abib the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. How many knew that? How many knew that the Lord took Israel out of Egypt in the month of Abib? You've got to be kidding. Are we, are, are, are we together? Are we on the same planet? <laughs> How many of you knew that, that, that Israel was the beneficiary of the Passover of the death angel in Egypt? And what day, and what day did that occur? The 14th of Nisan or Abib, right? Okay. And... Uh, now, that was on the Jewish calendar. On the Egyptian calendar, it was the 13th. And that's why Friday the 13th is unlucky to the Gentile world to this day. Didn't know that, huh? Interesting. 
Okay, so the, the, the Passover occurs, it's nailed to the calendar on the 14th of Nisan, or 14th of the Bib, here using the old term. And uh, uh, they, 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 they were, God brought them out by that event that night. Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God of the flock and of the herd in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. Thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it, Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread. Now, by the way, we've crossed a boundary here because there's a se- of the seven feasts, the first feast is the Passover. There's another feast that's seven days long called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But since it starts the next day, even though it's a separate feast and separately defined in Leviticus and so on, the term Passover is usually used connotatively to embrace the first three feasts altogether. There is a feast on the 14th of Nisan called the Passover, literally. There is a seven-day feast. The eighth day is a special day called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But also, the morning after Shabbat, after Passover, is the Feast of First Fruits. So you've got all three of these things lumped together in, the, in, in about a week, a little over a week's time. You with me so far? 40, well, I'll show you a little more in, in, in a little bit here. But when you, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a definitive feast of its own, even though it is lumped typically in many parlance, Passover is, a, is, is regarded as a season, not just a day. Thou shalt eat uh, no unleavened bread with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction. For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste. Part of the concept, not the only part, but part of the concept of having the bread unleavened was the idea to, to convey the idea that it was quick, it was spontaneous. They didn't have time to let it rise and do all the usual things. It was unleavened bread to remind them that they came forth in haste. That thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. Now what's fascinating is to this very day, in any uh, uh, observant Jewish household... Uh, the whole Passover thing is is now is observed is observed. It is recounted in terms of Exodus 12 and following, and they remember to this day this this event. It's fascinating to me to notice all through the Bible, God when He talks about Himself, more often than not, points to the deliverance of Egypt as His credential. Now, obviously, it's pretty dramatic. A lot of dramatic things in the Bible. But it's really rather remarkable. Be alert to the fact as you read your Bible how often God identifies himself with the redemption out of Egypt. It's far more profound, far more significant simply uh, ha- getting Israel out of Egypt. And there's more to it than that. But let's move on. There shall be no unleavened bread, uh, bread seen with thee in all thy coast seven days. Neither shall there be anything of the flesh which thou sacrificest the first day at evening remain all night until morning. What they eat, the Passover was to be eaten Completed that night. Also, they, even to this day, they have this interesting procedure where the children are to search the house and get rid of all the leaven. They usually hide a little leaven for the kids to find. They give them a prize and all that. But the whole idea is to make sure to get all the leaven out of the house. And uh, there's a whole, all of this has profound Christian significance. We'll come to some of that in a minute. Thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover within any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, but at the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in. There thou shalt sacrifice the Passover, even at the going down of the sun at the season that thou camest forth out of Egypt. This is a change in procedure. If you go back to Exodus 12 and there following, they were to do this in their homes. It was not a Levitical observation. It was, it was a person, every family had their own lamb. They had their own Passover. At this point, they're starting to enter, and we're going to see Moses start to put things in here where they are to do it centrally at a place the Lord shall choose. Now, he'll, it was Shiloh originally, Shechem, then it'll be Jerusalem ultimately. But the, 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 you will begin to see the need for some central authority, some centralization of this worship. So they won't do this anymore at home. In the, it, they, will, they will start, they, they, they may actually eat it at home, but they, they, they have it sacrificed and blessed by the priests at, at, the, at the tabernacle during the wandering and, and ultimately at uh, Jerusalem. Um, thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover with any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, but at the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in, which ultimately, of course, will be Jerusalem. Shallow and Shechem uh, taking uh, interim roles there. 
There thou shalt sacrifice the Passover at even, at the going down of the sun at the season that thou camest forth out of Egypt. And uh, actually it's between the evenings, as the, as the book of Exodus points out. And thou shalt roast it and eat it in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose, and thou shalt turn in the morning and go in unto thy tents. Six days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and the seventh day shall be a solemn assembly unto the Lord thy God. Thou shalt do no work therein. A very special day, and I'll come back to that. So this is Passover. And the Passover lamb is examined on the tenth of Nisan. And it was the tenth of Nisan that Jesus presented himself for inspection when he rode that donkey into Jerusalem. And uh, it's offered between the evenings on the 14th of Nisan. And I mentioned the Friday 13th thing. There are lots of details. We could spend easily more than a full evening just going through the details of Passover and their New Testament implications. But one of the ones that's most conspicuous, it's not only in, in the Torah, it's also in the Psalms and uh, uh, emphasize the New Testament that the, the Passover lamb had not to have a bone broken. And it's fascinating that Jesus, as he hung on the cross, that whole issue becomes an issue in which a, a career professional soldier violates his orders and doesn't break the bones as he was instructed to. Did he know he was fulfilling a prophecy? I don't think so. But it happens he was. He was told to break the bones. He chose not to. He threw the spear up instead. Um, fascinating. He obviously had enough rank that that didn't get him into trouble. But he was violating orders. Jesus, of course, is our Passover. He's so de designated in John chapter 1, several places, and also 1 Corinthians 5 and elsewhere. Jesus is our Passover. And one of the things I'll just leave you to do, if you haven't done it, and if you've done it, go ahead and review it, is to review all the ways that Passover, the Passover that the Jews acknowledge, is prophetic of Jesus Christ. There's a whole list of those things. Associated with it, but actually a separate feast, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Hag HaMatzah. Leaven is a t always has been in the scripture, Old and New Testament. It's a s symbol of sin. And why? Because it corrupts by puffing up. And uh, that's where sin first entered in, through pride. And, uh, and it's interesting that even today they take three matzahs and they, they take the middle one and break it and hide it. And uh, it's interesting that these ideas are even back in the days of Joseph when he's in prison, the baker and the wine steward. We have the bread and the wine introduced there that, of course, echo in advance the Lord's Supper, which consists of four cups, the bringing out, the delivering, the blessing, and the taking out. And when Paul says T this cup of blessing, he's, he, what he's indicating is apparently it was the third of the four cups that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper with. And the fourth one was never finished. It's an unfinished meal. His lips would not touch wine until we all together at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So there's a great deal of background. I invite you to spend time on. I won't derail this study to get into all of it, but I just want enough, some by way of review and others by way of enticing you to get in and, and do some digging in this area. It's very, very, very rich, very fulfilling. Then seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn, and thou shalt keep the feast of weeks. Unto the Lord thy God with the tribute of free will offering of thine hand, which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God according as the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Now Moses is summarizing this. The details of this are in Leviticus 23, and it's astonishing to me that the scripture, the Torah, is very clear in what it says, and yet no one does it the way the Torah tells them to. I'll come, come at, get at that in a little bit here. Thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God, thou and thy son, thy daughter, Notice the word rejoice. I want you to notice how often in the book of Deuteronomy, it, the, whole, the book of Deuteronomy is about love and joy. And all of this was intended to be a time of rejoicing. Thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God, thou and thy son, thy daughter, and thy manservant, thy maidservant, and the Levite that is within thy gates, and the stranger, ah, and the fatherless, and the widow and, and that are among you, in the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to place his name there. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman, in Egypt, and thou shalt observe to do these statutes. The Feast of First Fruits. This is a strange feast. It's overlooked by many prophecy buffs. Everybody gets on a different kick. In Leviticus 23, verse 11, it says, The morrow after Sabbath, after Passover. That phrase is very clear in the Hebrew, and it's interesting they don't really do it this way. 
Passover is on what day? We said a little while ago. It's on the what? 14th. 14th of, of Nisan. So it's nailed to the calendar. That means that Passover can be a different day of the week each year depending on how the calendar works because it's nailed to the calendar day, not the day of the week. You with me so far? On the moral, the morning, after Sabbath after Passover. So Passover can be some day of the week. It'll be followed by a Shabbat, a Saturday. The next morning is what it's talking about, which is always what? What day of the week will that be? Always a Sunday. That's the Feast of first fruits. And it's prophetically very relevant because that morning, one, one very morning, one early morning, when the Feast of First Fruits offering was rising from the temple that morning, a group of women were discovering an empty tomb. It happens that's the day that Jesus was resurrected, which also means that he was what? As Paul tells us in his epistles, we were his first fruits, okay? And it has to be plural, not just him. That's why in Matthew 27 we have this weird verse that no one really knows what it includes, where not only he was raised, but that many of the dead were also raised and went out showing themselves. Why? Because first fruits was plural. But he's the first. The morning after the of the ultimate first fruits. Now the question one of the questions I love to ask people is when did the flood of Noah end? A lot of Noah's starts in chapter 6 of Genesis, goes for 7, 8. If you, we all know about the story of Noah and the animals and all that stuff. When you have, when you have, by the way, when you have that story going on with anybody, ask somebody that thinks they know, how many of each animal did Noah take into the ark? Good. Seven of the clean, two of the unclean. When they realize it's not just two, it's seven of certain categories, then you ask them the corker. How did Noah know what was clean and unclean? See, they were defined in the Torah. That's Moses. That's centuries later. The answer is those definitions were codified in the Torah, but they were obviously instituted before, in fact, in the book of Genesis. And, uh, and that's why it's so significant of Cain and Abel's offering. Uh, uh, one was offering of faith, the offering of what was instructed, the lamb. And the fact that he was a herdsman isn't the point. It was, a, it was, a, it was the offering of faith in, instead of the offering of a cursed ground. And uh, the whole business of God giving Adam and Eve coats of skin was there to teach them that by the shedding of innocent blood, they'd be covered. It's, uh, there's, a Levit- there's a Levitical undertone to that that gets lost unless you go, go through the Torah and Revelation and then come back and you read it with, with more insight. But getting back to the, when did the flood of Noah end? And in, in, uh, in, uh, it's in, it turns out in Genesis chapter 8, verse 4, the ark came to rest in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. And if and you come to that verse, if you're a normal, well adjusted person, you read that and move on. But if you've been to one of my Bible studies, you are no longer a normal, well adjusted person. Because you'll recall that I said that every detail in the scriptures is there by design. Every, de- every place name, every detail. Why did the Holy Spirit want you to know that the ark came to rest in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month of the mountains of Ararat? The Holy Spirit wanted you to know that. It's recorded there. What's that got to do with anything? Well, a little background. You need to know that Jews have two calendars. In Genesis and in Deuteronomy, well, in Genesis, excuse me, in Genesis, the, they had uh, Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the new year. Rosh Hashanah, to this day, it's in the fall usually September on our calendar. But when you get to Exodus 12 and the Passover thing, when God is giving Moses all the instructions about the Passover, he says, this month, what's that? The month of Nisan, not Tishri, month of Nisan. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So in other words, the year always started in the fall, still does, the civil year, the Jewish New Year. But the religious year is redefined as starting at the time of the Passover or the month of Passover. It starts in the first of Nisan. Passover is on the 14th. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. So the Jews have two calendars. So you need to go through this a little bit. The old calendar, Tishri was the first month. That's in the fall. Sometimes called Ethanim, but that's, there's sometimes d- d- double names for these. You go right on through these. Nisan is actually the seventh month. Okay? Or it's also called Aviv or Abib. Um, now, what's interesting, if on the religious calendar... 
God says, this will be beginning of months to you. That's Nisan. That makes Nisan the first month. So you go through the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. The Tishri is the seventh month that the civil year starts. Well, it's interesting that Noah is obviously on the old calendar. And Noah, his, God's... Oh, a couple other, a couple other questions. When was Jesus crucified? On the 14th of Nisan. How long was he in the grave? Anyone? Three days and three nights. Good for you. Which means that if he was crucified on the 14th, he is resurrected on the 17th. Aha. Do you mean God's new beginning of the planet Earth under Noah was instituted on the anniversary in advance of our new beginning in Christ? Isn't that wild? Now that either blows you away or, you know, doesn't grab you. If not, don't worry about it. It blows me away, you know. Um, Because it has the aspect of, and there's dozens of these things that show you the whole thing is designed. It's all designed. Every detail is designed. And if it's designed, it's what in computer terms would be called a macro code, meaning it's a structure that's laid out in anticipation of things that haven't happened yet. When you touch a key in a word processor, it says, I'm going to send a fax. It formats the fax for you in advance, doesn't it? Because it knows what's coming. That's called a macro code. The Bible is full of macro. This is, what, this is a macro code. Because it anticipates the day that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. You know, centuries before the event. Shows that the design, as long as it designed, the design came from outside time and space. Supernatural. And you can prove it. You can't prove the Bible. Yes, you can. You've got to take a look at it. Feast of Israel. There are three feasts in the spring. Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and Feast of First Fruits. These are often, because they're so close together, lumped together to call Passover. They use the term connotatively. And uh, just like we may use the term Christmas to mean the Christmas season. Well, they, they speak of Passover meaning these three feasts because Passover triggers, in a sense, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which starts on the next day. The Feast of First Fruits is in the middle of all that because it depends on what day of the week Passover is. Well, no, excuse me, it doesn't matter what day of the week because it's the Shabbat after that. The next, it's the Sunday, in, in effect. It's the Sunday after Passover that uh, is the Feast of First Fruits. And that turns out to be a trigger for counting because they are to count what they call the counting of the Omer. They start counting not on Passover. They start counting on that Sunday. And uh, we'll come to that in a minute. There are three feasts in the spring, and there are three feasts in the fall, the seventh month, month of Tishri. Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets happens to be on the first of Tishri, but so is the, the civil new year, Rosh Hashanah, and the Feast of Trumpets are two separate things that happen on the same day. Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, the civil new year, is Rosh Hashanah. The Feast of Trumpets is... Uh, uh, an observance on that same day. In fact, it's been extended to be two days now, uh, uh, Feast of Trumpets. And then ten days later, we have Yom Kippur. That is the day of the, the, that is the most somber of all the observances in the Jewish uh, calendar. And uh, then we have uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, five days la- uh, five days later, day of number of grace. There's a, but the, the, there's three of the first, three in the second. And it, uh, my incentive to you to study this: the first three feasts all are provocatively uh, descriptive of the first coming of Jesus Christ. The three fall feasts all have to do with the second coming. But there's one strange one between these two groups. The Feast of Weeks, Hag Shavuot. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the Feast of Shavuot. Counting Omer, 49 days, seven sevens. From that, and, and the next day is the day. And, and they can, oh, by the way, this is the only feast that they are instructed to use leavened bread. You have to look for it to find it, but it's true. All the other feasts that unleavened emphasize this one is leavened bread, which gives it a Gentile flavor. And of course, it was prophetic because it was on the observance of this feast the church was born. It was when they were observing the feast of Shavuot, or putting it in the Greek, the feast of Pentecost. Um, that the Holy Spirit came down in Acts chapter two. You all know the story. It was. It was the. It was. The, this was the prophetic anticipation of that. Now there is a mystery about Enoch. I usually throw in here, which is the oldest prophecy in the Bible. Of the second. The oldest prophecy in the Bible uttered by a prophet is the, of the is of the second coming of Christ. 
But what's interesting is they have some traditions in the Hebrew culture that I have, haven't tracked down the source of. But they believe he, Enoch was born on Shavuot for some reason. Not on Shavuot, obviously, because that was instituted later, but on the day that th- thus becomes uh, uh, observed on Shavuot. But uh, it's also interesting that um, he was removed prior to the judgment of Noah, very conspicuously, and they have a tradition in, in, in the Jewish culture that he was removed on his birthday, that Enoch was translated on his birthday, which is also the Feast of Shavuot. So you sort of wonder, is it possible that the Jewish clock will restart on the same feast day that the clock was stopped? It's a possibility. I throw it out just to... Now you say, you, you know, you can't, don't set dates. This is, I'm not saying the rapture's on, on, on the Feast of Shavuot, because the Lord says, such a day as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. But if that's the day you think not, then maybe that's the day that... Okay. 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 Feast of Israel. Now, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, of course, is uh, consistent, it's coincident with Rosh Hashanah, and it has to do with the great blowing. So some people try to tie it to the last trump, but those you can, uh, and, and don't get confused this with the seventh trumpet judgment revelation. They have nothing to do with one another. And it's followed by uh, Yomim Norim, the days of affliction. And then we get to the Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur, Day of National Repentance. High, it's the only day the high priest can enter the Holy of Holies. Only one guy ever, and that's only on this particular day after great ceremonial preparation. There's a scapegoat. All these things are uh, 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 perfect, uh, uh, prophetic of Jesus Christ. But then we have the last one of the whole year, which many, many people, many good scholars feel that this is that going to be somehow associated with the rapture. I don't, but they, they, many people do. Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Booths. And uh, it's very possible that this was that was the day on feast of on feast of tabernacles that they were that Matthew 17 took place the transfiguration. That's why Peter has this fixation of building booths and so forth. And uh, that's but anyway, this is the feast when they leave. They for a week they build these temporary dwellings today in in, in Israel. They will build these or even in, in Jewish community they'll build these temporary dwellings in their backyard. And the roof has to, you have to be able to see the stars through the lats. And the wind has to blow through the sides. You've got to make them defective, in other words. Because the idea is, is to remind them of the or- ordeal of the wilderness wanderings. And after seven days in that, then they leave their temporary dwellings to go back to their permanent dwellings. And so that's all prophetic and interesting. And that may be First uh, uh, Corinthians 5, 2, for those of you who want to get into that. Thou shalt observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days after thou hast gathered in thy corn and thy wine, and thou shalt rejoice in thy feast, thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant and maidservant and the Levite, the stranger and the fatherless, the widow, and within thy gates. It's a, day, it's a time of rejoicing. Seven days shalt thou keep a solemn feast unto the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord shall choose, because the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thine increase and in all thy works of thine hands. Therefore from, uh, thou shalt surely re- rejoice. So it's a seven-day thing. Now we come to an instruction in Deuteronomy 16.16. 16. You can remember it that easily. Because three times a year, in other words, three of these feasts that we've gone through, three special ones, shall the, all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord thy God which he hath given thee. These are strange feasts to choose. You know, if you take a list of the feasts that we've talked about, the three spring feasts, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, you would think that Passover certainly would be one of these, wouldn't you? Feast of Weeks, that's sort of an odd one. Uh, Fall of Feast, there's the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, Feast of Tabernacles. God has chosen three of these to be so special that if you're able-bodied male Jew, you are to go to Jerusalem to observe these three feasts. There are strange ones. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now some people say one of the three feasts is Passover. Well, using that term connotatively, you can get away with it, but that's not what the specification Deuteronomy 16, 16 says. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then there's the Feast of Weeks. Boy, that's interesting. That suddenly elevates that peculiar feast to a very high level. And then the Feast of Tabernacles. And so prophecy buffs begin to suspect that these three feasts may have some peculiar role yet to be defined. Why am I saying that? Because it's interesting, there are, there's a term in the Bible called the appointed times. And I'm going to just 
close on this for uh, stimulation. Uh, Rabbi Hirsch has said the Jew's catechism is his calendar. What on earth did he mean by that? Well, it turns out that the Jewish calendar is heptatic. That is seven. Everything is sevens. There are a week of days. How many have noticed that? Okay, good. There's also a week of weeks. The week of Shavuot, the feast of weeks, the week of Shavuot. There's a week of months, the religious years, from first to the seventh month, and the week of years, the sabbatical year. We talked about that earlier in this session. Also, if you take seven weeks of years and add one, you get to what they call the jubilee year. There again, it's derivative of a heptatic structure. That's in the jubilee year. All land reverts to its owners. All slaves go free. All debts are forgiven. And it's the, it's, Peter refers to this in, Acts, in his sermon in Acts chapter 3 as a time of the restitution of all things, which is a term it sounds like it's a second coming term. Kind of fun. So that makes the Jubilee year probably worth studying. But the appointed times. You know, it's interesting that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. You all remember that from your reading of Genesis 1. This word that is translated seasons is an interesting word. Hamoyadim. It actually means the appointed times. It's translated seasons, which is a reasonable construction for the King James translators. But the term means the appointed times. So these let be for signs and the appointed times for days and for years. It's interesting, to any Jew that's done his homework, there are, interestingly enough, 70 Hamoyedim. There are 52 Shabbats in a year, 52 Sabbaths in a year, right? There's also seven days of Passover, that is if you include its related feast days, using Passover connotatively. Then, uh, you know, 49 days later, we got this uh, Shavuot, which is a feast of weeks, that's a one-day thing. Then at Yom Teruah, which is the feast of trumpets, which is a one-day thing. Observed two days in modern terms, but it was originally a one-day thing. The Yom Kippur, as, 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 as hallowed as it is, it's a one-day thing. You've got Sukkot, which is the seven days of Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles. And the last day of that, the Shemini Etzeret, is, uh, is one day. When you add that up, interesting, it's seven. There are 70 appointed times. Are you with me so far? Okay. The appointed times... That term, if you search on a computer and search the entire book of Genesis, you would expect that that particular combination of letters would occur probably about five times. The, the book of Genesis, the letter of Genesis has about 78,000 letters. And you'd expect, just using raw statistics and the frequency of those letters in the Hebrew language, that that particular word would show up five times just by randomness. You with me so far? But very strangely, it only shows up once as an equidistant. When I say it shows up, I mean in terms of an equidistant sequence. You can set the computer to look at every second letter, every third letter, every fourth letter. You can could, could have the computer exhaust them all. And it turns out that if you try all the possible ones, it only shows up once. And it happens to be an interval of, guess what? 70. And guess what? It's centered on Genesis 1.14. How many think that was accidental? How many of you think that's an accident of linguistic statistics or what have you? My, my career field is cryptography. Let me tell you, the probability is so absurd that forget it. In fact, it's been estimated by experts that the odds of this occurring by unaided chance have, have like 70 million to one. So uh, if you think that just happened that way, you're welcome to your view. Uh, you'd be... Uh, at variance to anyone that has background in advanced statistics. Anyway, I um, thought you'd find that interesting. Just to, <coughs> Let's continue doing Deuteronomy 16. Judges and officers shall make the... Now he's talking about... Now he's shifting subjects. He's going to, uh, from, the, from the pilgrim festivals to the requirements for officers. And he's going to carry this on in chapter 17, the next session. Judges and officers shall thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout all, the, through thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. The book of Deuteronomy opened up with, uh, with uh, Moses recounting the fact that he'd already pointed these elders and so forth. So this is a really a reflexive back to the first chapter, but let's go on. Thou shalt not wrest judgment, thou shalt not respect persons, nor take a gift. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise, and pervert the words of the righteous. 
And you can assemble literally a dozen passages in the book of Proverbs that say essentially the same thing. That you, you know, your bribe, uh, 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 is, is a bribe or a gift uh, distorts uh, true justice. One of the great tragedies in our culture is that we don't have godly judges. We have even at the highest, the highest court of the land uh, is doing, uh, indulges in social engineering rather than interpret the law and certainly does not interpret the law from a God-fearing perspective, tragically. And it's tragic to see, too, how in the Congress, in the Senate, I should say, there is such a vigorous obstruction of letting any God-fearing judge be appointed. Uh, you watch that drama occur daily. But uh, thou shalt not rest in judgment, thou shalt not respect persons. It's interesting, you know, we had not long ago, uh, Martin Luther King give this, stirred all our hearts with a speech that he would want his children not judged by the color of their skin, but by their character. And the Supreme Court has just reversed its years of precedent by endorsing the idea, it, it is turning away from what we'd call color blindness in the law to one of appro- uh, supporting um, um, Affirmative action uh, segments and so forth. In other words, making being colored a qualification for certain things, which is total reversal in the spirit of the law of the past. If you look at if you look at theory of law, or if you look at uh, precedents, it's it's tragic that it's just a uh, the, uh, a wind of change in, in the highest courts. Anyway, um, for a gift doth blind the guys, eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. That which is altogether just shalt thou follow, that thou mayest live and inherit the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not plant. A, now he's talking about enforcing some things here. He, he, the, the subject is really judgment and judge justice, but he's going to talk about enforcing the things he talked about earlier in terms of idolatry. Thou shalt not plant thee a grove of any trees near unto, any, uh, unto the altar of the Lord thy God, which thou shalt make thee. When he says grove, the word is ashtarah, it's not just a tree, it's one that has been sculpted to be a phallic symbol in effect. It was part of the pagan worship of, uh, of, of, uh, 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 of fertility and so on. Thou shalt not plant it. So that's why he didn't want any groves or trees near the altar. Um, the near to the altar of the Lord thy God, that which thou shalt make thee. Neither shalt thou set thee up any image which the Lord thy God hateth. And uh, so we'll, he'll pick up this topic in the next session.